Hi, everyone. I'm Vladimir Gitit. We are watching all the news happening in the United States and around the world. Check out these monitors behind me. These are news feeds coming into the CBS News Broadcast Center from all of our stations and affiliates around the country. If it's happening out there, it's coming to you live right here. This is CBS News 24-7. Vice President Kamala Harris is now the first woman of color to accept the major party's presidential nomination. We'll recap her historic speech during the final night of the DNC, and we will look ahead to what's next for the campaign. Plus, independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. may exit the race as soon as today. There is speculation now that he could throw his support behind Donald Trump. We'll tell you what they have planned and how Kennedy's departure might impact the race. And we are just moments away. From hearing about the state of the economy, Fed Chair Jerome Powell is set to speak this hour. The question is, will he give any hints on upcoming cuts to interest rates? We'll monitor that and bring you updates as soon as he begins. But we begin this morning with a history-making night on the final night of the Democratic National Convention, with Vice President Kamala Harris officially accepting her party's nomination for President of the United States. She is the first black and South Asian woman to accept the presidential nomination for a major political party. And in what many people called a solid speech, the former prosecutor laid out her case to defeat former President Donald Trump in an election that is now just 74 days away. With this election, has a precious, fleeting opportunity to move past the bitterness, cynicism, and divisive battles of the past, a chance to chart a new way forward. Just imagine Donald Trump with no guardrails. And how he would use the immense powers of the presidency of the United States. Not to improve your life, not to strengthen our national security, but to serve the only client he has ever had, himself. I promise to be a president for all Americans. You can always trust me to put country above party and self. I accept your nomination to be president of the United States of America. Joining me now with the very latest is CBS News campaign reporter Nidia Cavazos. Uh, so Nidia, we, we played some highlights from the vice president's speech and we know one of her objectives was to show the American people who she is. We wanted a little bit of a biography uh, and also what she was hoping to accomplish. Uh, did she do that last night? Good morning, Vlad. We can definitely say that this is something that Vice President Harris was able to accomplish as a great portion of her speech last night was focused on who she is as a person, her upbringing and being raised as a within a middle class family. And of course, a lot of this was also a tribute to her mother. And it makes sense that she was able to tell this story, given she says her mother immigrated at 19 years old from India in search of the American dream, in search of a better life for Harris and her sister Maya and so she goes in and to tell these stories to communicate to the American public that she ha she's able to relate to the middle class family. She's able to relate to their struggles, to the immigrant struggles in order to search for a better life and, ser and searching for a better career. And we also learned a lot of details and she was able to share these with her public yesterday. For example, why she even became a lawyer in the first place. And this is she shared that it's because she was when she was in high school, she learned that her best friend was being sexually assaulted by her father. And so so these are all experiences that have shaped Harris throughout her entire career and throughout her entire life. And all of this, of course, is an effort to show who she is, why she's even running for president of the United States in the first place. Yeah, Nidia, I also thought uh, excellent points that you're making there. But I also thought one of the things that she did uh, is she tried to appeal to 
uh, not just people in that room, in that uh, arena, which are obviously Democrats, but to people who might still be on the fence and even people who might have voted for former President Donald Trump, but, for example, who don't like the fact that he now has 34 criminal convictions uh, as, as part of his rap sheet. Um, the other thing that sort of I, I caught my attention was uh, the families of both candidates that really seemed to steal the show at various points throughout the convention uh, from uh, uh, the from Governor Walsh's son, Gus, uh, you know, who got up very emotionally saying, that's my dad, to uh, Vice President Harris's grandnieces with that very cute little bit on how to pronounce her name, because we know that either because people don't know the vice president that well, they may uh, mispronounce her name, or because they're just being trolls, they try to mispronounce it. And that's exactly right. We've seen a lot of these small moments, but it's these small moments that matter a lot because we have to remember that really it's only been about four and a half weeks or five since Vice President Harris launched her presidential campaign. And despite the fact that she's been Vice President of the United States, many voters that we've been talking to on the trail say they yet don't know enough about her. And it's only been about three and a half weeks since many Americans were first introduced to Governor Tim Walz. And so it's these small moments that help Americans know who these families are and really what their upbringing is as they make promises, as they make campaign promises and establish why they're running and why they want to serve. And they're also making their cases to Americans. All right, Nidia, thank you very, very much for your reporting all this week. We appreciate it. Okay, let's talk about former President Trump, who visited the U.S.-Mexico border in Arizona yesterday, where he talked about immigration policy. Now, during that visit, Trump spent some time attacking Vice President Harris's stance on the border. Listen. She wants our country. I don't understand why anybody would want it, but she wants our country to be open to the world's criminals. She's the most radical left person who has ever run for high political office in our country's history. CBS News campaign reporter Olivia Rinaldi joins me now from Las Vegas, where former President Trump will be later today, and then he will head to Arizona for an event. Uh, so, Olivia, uh, what are we expecting out of these events today? Uh, obviously, the former president was rage posting last night in the middle of Kamala Harris's speech, uh, and he also called in to Fox News and to Newsmax. Uh, so we can expect perhaps a reaction to what he heard last night. But as you know, as you've been reporting, his campaign would prefer that he stick on message because they think they can actually win if he does that. Yeah, Vlad, uh, today kind of uh, caps out this very long week that Donald Trump has had traveling to other battleground states working on counter-programming uh, to the Democratic National Convention. But now that it has ended, Donald Trump is coming back here to Las Vegas today to hold an event for his no tax on tips policy. And you know as well as I do, we've covered this policy extensively when he announced it a few months ago in Las Vegas. And even more in the last couple of weeks since Vice President Kamala Harris announced that she's also endorsing this kind of policy, but she's coupling it with the raise of a federal minimum wage. So Trump is here today to talk about that, um, and I'm sure he will address the Democratic National Convention as he's been doing for the last several stops um, on this battleground tour. But the important thing that's also happening today is he's holding a rally in Phoenix, or the Glendale area of uh, Arizona. And what's interesting about that is we're hearing reports that Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's also in the race running as an independent, formerly running as a Democrat, now running as an independent, is sincerely considering dropping out and endorsing the former president. Now, that would have shockwaves, really, throughout this race, because what that would do is perhaps give a little bit of a boost to former President Donald Trump when President Biden was in the race uh, Mr. Kennedy was pulling from both Biden, uh, his share of the vote, but also from Trump's, you know, at some points taking a little bit more from Trump. But if he were to drop out, throw his support behind uh, Trump, it, it would certainly create some type of, uh, of rise and movement there. So or we're expecting that it would. So we're watching that very closely today. But this is capping out a very long week of battleground touring from the former president. Uh, uh, we know, Olivia, as you know, uh, that uh, the former president is adamant that he's ahead in most of the polls. But uh, one of the things that uh, I've been doing uh, is speaking to voters. Uh, I did a piece the other day for CBS Mornings where I spoke to people uh, who are not from New York City, but who happen to be visiting New York. Um, and so we talked to people from Texas and from Virginia and from the battleground state of Pennsylvania. And one of the things that we heard uh, is uh, from, I heard from one a young woman whose parents voted for uh, President Trump in the last two elections, but are now 
thinking about reconsidering that vote because of some of the things that uh, we've talked about, the criminal convictions, the sexual assault uh, civil case. And I wonder if we, since we don't have a sense of what the polls are going to look like in three or four days when we'll see either a bump or not from this Democratic convention, how voters are feeling now about uh, the economy, the border, two of the biggest things that he has going for him. Is that enough for him to hold on until November? Well, we'll have to see. I mean, even among our own polling, our CBS News polling, it shows that the economy and immigration are very, very important to voters, more than abortion, more than any other issues, gun control rights, anything like that. So those are two very key issues, and Trump knows that. That's why we saw him at the border yesterday talking about immigration, meeting with mothers and families of, of people who, you know, perhaps had lost a loved one to uh, a, a migrant who had came over the border, it, you know, Trump really leans into a lot of that messaging. So talking to a lot of those families yesterday, he knows that that's a soft spot. He knows that that's something um, that would gather attention. So that's why he's talking about immigration and the economy so much and why he's coming here today to do that no tax on tips event. Yeah, Olivia, uh, I know we got to run, but just in like 20 seconds or so, because I, I don't know the answer, has the former president ever addressed the fact that he was the one who scuttled that bipartisan legislation that would have fixed the border issue that he's now campaigning on? Yeah, Vlad, he was asked about that yesterday at the border, and he said simply it was a bad bill, and that's his belief on it. He felt like Republicans shouldn't have voted for it either way. All right, Olivia Rinaldi reporting for us uh, from Las Vegas, uh, where she is tracking all of former President Trump's movements. Thank you. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is sending about $125 million in new military aid to Ukraine as Kyiv intensifies its campaign against Russia. You can see some pictures coming into us right now. A drone strike yesterday hit a critical military airbase in southwest Russia, and another Ukrainian drone strike hit a cargo ferry loaded with fuel tanks on a key port used for moving freight into Crimea. CBS News' Ian Lee has the very latest. Hi there. Another day, another Ukrainian strike deep into Russian-controlled territory, this time at a key port on the Black Sea. Moscow accuses Kyiv of attacking a civilian ferry that was carrying fuel to the occupied Crimea. Posts on social media show the ship in flames, but there haven't been any reports of casualties. Now, further north, Russian forces continue to take ground. They're about six miles from the strategic city of Pokrovsk. Kyiv is issuing a mandatory evacuation as the fighting moves closer. Ukrainian troops, though, remain optimistic that they can hold Moscow's forces at bay. And that's because some of those Russian soldiers are being redirected to Russia's Kursk region. On that front, U.S. officials see the offensive slowing down. And they give two reasons. The first is the Kremlin is reinforcing its defenses. And two, Ukraine is starting to transition to holding the ground that they've taken. Meanwhile, a U.S. official confirms the Biden administration is expected to announce a $125 million aid package for Ukraine as soon as today. The package is expected to include high Mars ammunition, counter drone systems, Javelin anti-armor weapons and artillery shells. Vlad. All right, Ian, thank you very much. Tropical Storm Hone is churning in the Central Pacific Ocean. Hawaii is under Tropical Storm Watch. Hone is expected to pass south of the island chain over the weekend, bringing strong winds and heavy rain. Hurricane Center says the Big Island is expected to get at least up to eight inches of rain. Let's bring in CBS News Philadelphia meteorologist Tammy Sousa with the first look at the national forecast. Tammy. Well, hello to you, Vlad. Yeah, you know, it's not a hurricane we're talking about in the Atlantic. This time we are focusing on the Pacific, which is quite busy because we have three different things. We have a system that could develop. Yeah, that could become Hector. That's closest to uh, Mexico. We're looking at uh, Hurricane Gilma, and then we are looking at Tropical Storm Hone. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at, actually, globe-wise, where we are talking about. What we're talking about is right here in the, uh, in the Atlantic, the eastern Atlantic, out toward Hawaii. So that's the, uh, the area of our biggest concern. And again, this is all about Hawaii and the big island being affected more than the other islands. So let's take a zoom in. Let's take a look at what's going on right now. This is Hone, tropical storm, about 46 mile an hour winds. It's moving to the west, but it will be moving off to the northwest. and It'll be just to the south of the big island of Hawaii. All of the Hawaiian islands will feel uh, the tropical storm force winds. So as we move through time, we're going to be watching this uh, storm actually begin to strengthen. And just as it passes the big island to the south, it's being steered by high pressure to the north. So as it passes, 
passes by, it will actually strengthen into a hurricane. And that's where they're going to be concerned with this big surf. Of course, the surfers love the big surf. Not so much all the officials trying to keep people out of the water there. So that's something we'll be watching. This is going to happen for Saturday and Sunday as it passes the Hawaiian Islands. Now, another place we're watching is the Caribbean and the Atlantic, which are absolutely peaceful right now. Just some general disturbances, but we do not have any signs of anything developing, not coming off of the African coastline, not in the Central Atlantic, and not in the Caribbean. When I come back in just a couple of minutes, Vlad, we're going to talk about here at home, what you can expect for your weekend. Make those outdoor plans in some places. Back over to you. Really important details. Looking forward to that, Tammy. Thank you very much. Okay, let's talk about Fair Fed Chairman Jerome Powell, who is outlining where our economy stands and how we arrived here. There he is. We're going to find out next if he's signaling that interest rates may come down at some point in the near future. So stick around. You're streaming CBS News 24-7. Right now, Federal Reserve Chair Powell is in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where he's giving a speech at the Fed's yearly retreat. Here's what he just had to say moments ago on the issue of inflation. Listen to this. Inflation is now much closer to our objective, with prices having risen 2.5% over the past 12 months. After a pause earlier this year, progress toward our 2% objective has resumed. My confidence has grown that inflation is on a sustainable path back to 2%. All right, I want to bring in Barron's Market reporter, Jacob Sunshine, for more on this. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jacob, how, how important or how closely watched is this particular speech? I know he does this every year at Jackson Hole, but I think there's a lot of people who have a lot of interest in, in this speech this time around because of what we are hoping to hear about next month's Fed meeting. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's closely watched. It's closely watched every summer for sure. Um, I, I would say right now, the, the way you have to view the financial market and, and, and the Jackson Hole speech is that we know going into the September Fed meeting, which is different than the Jackson Hole Symposium, going into the September meeting, we know that the market is fully expecting a rate cut. We know that uh, uh, short-term treasury yields are well down from their peaks. That is relief to the stock market. And the S&P 500 is very close to uh, regaining, uh, going back to its all-time high. So if Powell says anything that sounds like um, only one rate cut, no more after that, anything that sounds like there's not going to be a cut, uh, uh, rates would go up and stocks would come down. I don't think that's going to happen. And you just heard what he said. He's trying to say things that are fact, like inflation at 2.5 percent. We're almost at 2 percent. He's trying to use facts to outline to the market that we're heading down, to, that, that we're going to get a rate cut. Um, he he doesn't want rates to go up too much because he wants to make sure the economy is in a good place um, because inflation is already coming down. So he's going to have to do an artful job, you know, but but he's going to use facts rather than speculation um, to outline to the market, as he just did, uh, that rates, uh, you know, inflation is coming down and, and rates are coming down. Uh, so uh, I don't know, Jacob, have you seen this, that uh, former President Trump says he would not call the shots on monetary policy, uh, despite previous claims that he would want to handle it. But just uh, explain to our viewers, the president of the United States does not set monetary policy. The president does not set monetary policy. Jerome Powell does. Uh, the, the chairman, of the, the chairperson of the Federal Reserve um, ultimately is an appointed position. So you have to remember that. Um, but the, those words from former President Trump um, have no bearing on uh, what Jerome Powell will decide to do. I'm not in Jerome Powell's mind, um, but they will have no impact on the market. Uh, they don't matter. All right, Jacob. Uh, yeah, we see the market is up, uh, reacting uh, to uh, either the perception uh, or perhaps what uh, Chairman Powell is saying uh, out there uh, this afternoon. You're taking what we're seeing right now as we put up the Dow for our viewers to check out. Okay, what we're seeing right now in stocks uh, and in rates, we're, get, we're, we're getting short-term Treasury yields moving down. Uh, that's basically a prediction that the bond market is saying, yep, we're getting a rate cut in September. 
Uh, and we're getting stocks moving up because everybody's relieved that, you know, moderate economic growth will continue. You're not going to get an increased challenge from interest rates, which are down from peaks. And what you have with stocks right now is you're, when you're showing a chart of the Dow uh, at 41,000. That's somewhere near its record. The S&P 500 is about 5,600, which is just below its record. So the market is rebounding from that little decline we saw a few weeks ago. We're not making new highs yet. And all the stock market is saying right now is, yes, we think we're getting rate cuts. Yes, we think the economy is currently sidestepping recession. Um, we're not seeing this big breakout to new records, um, which is notable. Um, I think we certainly will in time. Um, but right now, financial markets are saying we're comfortable that rates are below peaks and we're comfortable that moderate economic growth can continue. All right. Jacob Sonnenstein for us uh, on this Friday. Jacob, thanks, man. Have a nice weekend. Thanks. You too. All right, folks, have you noticed the stubbornly high costs of using ATMs lately? If so, you're not alone. In fact, banks are charging record amounts these days. We're going to break down the rising fees next. You're streaming CBS News 24-7. Here's a look at some of the top stories we're following for you this morning. The juice may not be worth the squeeze when it comes to getting cash from the ATM. Banks are cashing in on record charges for non-customers using their machines. A new survey found the average out-of-network fee is up 4% from 2023, pushing the fee close to nearly $5 this year. It's the highest average total fee since the personal finance website bank rate started tracking them back in 1998. The FDA approved an updated round of COVID-19 vaccines. The latest ones are designed to counter multiple variants that are circulating around the United States. Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines are set to begin shipping right away, while Novavax says it will release its vaccine at a later date. The CDC recommends anyone ages six months and up to get the updated shot. And there may be a girl out there missing a best friend, you know, because diamonds are a girl's best friend. <laughs> Check out this giant gem. That is a nearly 2,500 carat diamond that was unearthed at a mine in Botswana by a Canadian mining company using X-ray technology. It is the second largest diamond ever found in a mine. It weighs one pound. Officials say it's a high quality stone, but too early to determine a value. Man, how do I get my hands on that? Like send the Pink Panther. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's turn back to our top story. Kamala Harris made history last night as, the, as she officially accepted the Democratic presidential nomination. She's the first black and South Asian woman to accept that nomination for the presidency of the United States. And in her address, the vice president shared her life story while also taking several pot shots at former President Trump. Joining me now with the very latest is CBS News Minnesota reporter Caroline Cummings. All right, Caroline, one of the things uh, that she made, uh, which I think seemed to go over very well in that crowd, was about the Israel-Hamas war. That's been a big talking point uh, surrounding the convention. I want to play a little bit of what she had to say, and let's talk about it. President Biden and I are working to end this war such that Israel is secure, the hostages are released, the suffering in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. So it seemed to get an applause, uh, Caroline, uh, and, and I, it feels like from the people in that convention hall, that the vice president did a good job of threading that needle where she unequivocally stated the United States support of its ally, the state of Israel, not only to exist, but to defend itself, and also express the humanity towards people suffering in Gaza. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thread the needle was the exact phrase I was going to use. It's like you read my mind there, because this is this delicate balance that uh, the Democrats are in right now, because there is, of course, a lot of outrage from um, parts of the party over the war in Gaza and the suffering there. And there was so much so that there was a protest vote during the presidential primary, the uncommitted delegates. And there were, they were represented here at the DNC this week. They actually held a sit-in at a, a part of this convention because they wanted to have a Palestinian speaker on stage. Ultimately, that did not happen. So she was trying to strike a balance to say, like you said, what the United States policy on Israel is and that that 
remains, but that that the she recognizes what the people of Gaza are going through. And a lot of these uncommitted delegates, I interviewed many of them actually in Minnesota on primary night because Minnesota sent the largest uh, number of uncommitted delegates to this convention. And they really just felt like they needed to be heard and that this was their way to be heard and that they did not want to let Democrats, you know, take advantage of their vote and that they had a voice. And that's why they voted uncommitted. And so they are really pushing for a ceasefire deal. And I think, um, you know, Harris's language last night appealed to uh, the, the all corners of the party on this issue. And as you know, uh, Caroline, both uh, Vice President Harris and Governor Walls need an introduction to the wider American public. Uh, were they able to accomplish that at this convention? I think they were. For Harris, it was talking about that personal story, reminding people of her background growing up as a kid in Oakland before ascending to these other barrier-breaking roles she had, first as, um, you know, the prosecutor in, in San Francisco and then California attorney general, um, then to being a barrier-breaking vice president to now being a barrier-breaking presidential nominee, though she didn't really ever mention that, um, interestingly. It was kind of just, you know, understood. Uh, I think for Governor Tim Walls, uh, the real moment that people connected with was when his son was overwhelmed with emotion, because any American watching at home can understand the bond between a parent and child. So those were my, kind of my big takeaways here, Vlad. Yeah, uh, I, I thought that was a beautiful moment, too. Uh, the only endorsement you need, that of your children. Uh, Caroline, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure with you all week. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, the search may be sadly officially over for six missing people after a yacht sank off an Italian coast. The unidentified bodies believed to be the 18-year-old daughter of British tech CEO Mike Lynch. Let's bring in BBC foreign correspondent Bethany Bell with the very latest on this complicated and dangerous search. Uh, it's such a horrible story, Bethany. Uh, how close are authorities to being able to identify that last body that was found? Well, we understand uh, from sources close to the Lynch family that the one missing person who still had not been found was 18-year-old Hannah Lynch, Mike Lynch's daughter. Today, the authority, the Emergency services here said that they had recovered that final missing body. Now, under Italian law, the identification uh, process is a very formal one. And we watched from the port as the diving team of boats, Coast Guard boats, brought the body to the shore. We understand the body was then put in an ambulance and taken to a mortuary where the green light has been given for autopsies to go ahead and for the official identification process to go ahead. It's such a terrible, terrible story. Uh, Bethany, thank you for reporting uh, from there for us. Uh, and our, certainly our hearts go out to all those family members who lost loved ones in this horrific, horrific, horrific sinking. Thank you. All right, uh, let's talk about the Israeli military that says some preliminary forensic findings indicate that all six bodies of Israeli hostages that were recovered in Gaza this week showed signs of gunshot wounds. Officials stress it's unclear if they were killed by their captives or by friendly fire from Israeli forces. Let's bring in BBC News correspondent Weira Davies. Uh, Weira, this conversation is horrific in and of itself, but um, before we, 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 we talk about peace talks and where they stand in the region currently, uh, what are Israelis saying about the recovery of those bodies and what, if anything, is Hamas saying? Well, Hamas has said nothing about them, uh, apart from blaming Israel for their deaths. But, of course, after the bodies were recovered early this week, um, investigations continued and there were reports that uh, some of those bodies had gunshot wounds. But we don't know how that happened, whether they were killed in a firefight, whether they were killed by Hamas. And at this stage, it's impossible to say exactly how or when they died. But of course, the recovery of those six bodies of the hostages had put even greater focus, even greater attention on the need uh, to achieve a peace deal, say the, the, the families of the remaining hostages. More than 100 hostages are thought to be held in Gaza. About uh, more than 70 of them are thought still to be alive. The others, sadly, are thought to be dead. But there's another reason and another reminder this week why there's a huge uh, body of people here in, in Israel who really want a, a peace deal um, 
achieved. They might agree with their government's war aims in Gaza, but the overriding uh, priority for many and most Israelis, I would say, is to get a deal so those remaining hostages can, can be released. Uh, we were, there was an incredibly powerful moment uh, this week during the Democratic National Convention when the parents of one of the hostages, one of the Israeli hostages being held, made a plea. Uh, there was some concern that because the perception of Democrats being uh, 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 in favor of a quick ceasefire deal um, and, and, and humanitarian aid to Gaza, that perhaps the reception in the crowd might be less than courteous. But in fact, it was a rousing reception uh, from uh, the people in the convention hall. And the parents of this young man uh, are essentially pleading for uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to hammer out a peace deal, uh, or ceasefire, rather, I should say, with Hamas. How close are we to getting that done? Well, th those are the parents of Hirsch Goldberg, Poland. People I've met uh, myself, they've campaigned for his release um, uh, f for many, many months. What was interesting, I think, about their speeches is, of course, they, they uh, want the peace deal done to get him, hopefully, released alive uh, and the other hostages. But they also expressed concern for the, uh, the plight of, of civilians in Gaza as well. Remember, more than 40,000 people are reportedly to have been killed in Gaza during the 10 months of war. And that is one reason why there is so much international pressure from the Americans in particular, mindful of the election which you've got there in November, to get a peace deal sorted. Talks are continuing in Egypt today. There's conflicting news coming out of those talks. Hamas officials have told the BBC that they don't see any progress, they don't see anything that will perhaps bring them closer to a ceasefire. But unconfirmed reports in parts of the Israeli media say that there has been uh, some sort of progress. The, the, key, the key sticking areas aren't big, but we don't know yet if a peace deal is going to be achieved. All right. Uh, Weir Davies reporting uh, from Jerusalem for us this morning. Thank you so much, Weir. Appreciate it. Okay, we're learning a little bit more about the new antitrust uh, lawsuit the Department of Justice plans to file today. This uh, is about real estate software companies using real page of its uh, algorithms to allow illegal rental price fixing. CBS News Homeland Security and Justice reporter Nicole Skanga joins me now with the very latest. Uh, so, so, Nicole, this might be because people have been paying attention to what's going on in Israel and Gaza. People have been paying attention to the conventions, the race for the presidency. This might have flown under the radar for some folks. So break down what's going on here and what the Justice Department is hoping to achieve. Yeah, Vlad, a lot of news going on, but I think renters are going to care about this one. And this is the latest chapter in a large antitrust book that the Biden administration has been writing for months, years. Another suit that underscores DOJ's focus on calling out misuse of technology, uh, you know, creations of monopolies that harm competition, that harm consumers. You know, previous chapters of the same book have targeted Google, Amazon, Meta, Apple. Now, we're going to learn more about exactly what's in the pages of this lawsuit in the coming hour, and we expect actually to hear uh, from Attorney General Merrick Garland shortly. But just to give you a sense, RealPage is a revenue management software company uh, the company and dozens of property owners and managers that use it are already the targets of class action lawsuits brought by renters. Suits have even been filed by state attorneys general uh, in Arizona, in Washington, D.C. And we expect this lawsuit to accuse the company RealPage of facilitating a price-fixing conspiracy that raised rents, cheating some of the market forces. Now, RealPage's software, which is called YieldStar, it gathers real estate info, and landlords who pay for the software, they share that information about rents and occupancy rates uh, that otherwise would be confidential. So based on that data, an algorithm generates suggestions for what landlords should charge renters. Those numbers are often higher than they would be in a competitive market. DOJ calling out this conduct as anti-competitive. And again, Vlad, just to give you a sense, we could be talking about millions of apartments nationwide. Hmm. And how has RealPage responded, Nicole? Yeah, in a statement this morning, RealPage said that, you know, its revenue management software is purposely built to be legally compliant, that they have a history of working constructively with the Department of Justice to show that. Uh, that statement goes on to say that in 2017, when DOJ granted antitrust clearance for RealPage's acquisition of another company, 
LRO at that time, DOJ also analyzed information about their software products without objecting to them in any way. We will see how the U.S. government responds. I suspect U.S. attorneys here will point not to any previous merger, Vlad, but to recent conduct and performance of RealPage's algorithm to beat the market and ultimately to raise the rent on consumers. All right, Nicole, thank you very much for that important update. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's bring in CBS News Philadelphia meteorologist Tammy Sousa with another look at the national forecast. Tammy. Well, happy Friday to you, Vlad, and everybody at home. Okay, what we're going to talk about this time is not the tropical storm that will affect Hawaii, but home sweet home, United States, in the uh, lower 48. So that's what we really want to do. Now, what we're going to be looking at for your weekend ahead is a pretty decent weekend for most of us. There is a chance of rain and even some storms out across the west, and that's the Intermountain West. And it also includes Arizona all the way up into Nevada because, you know what, it's monsoon season, so we could see parts of that area being wet. Very dry, very hot when you get into the southern plains. Maybe a sprinkle into the Midwest, maybe up into New England, and it does look like, sadly, if you're going to be working on the tan in Florida, you're going to have to do it with an umbrella by your side because it looks like it is going to be a bit on the wet side. Now, let's talk about that heat. It is pretty intense from Texas and all the way up into the southern plains, and the feels like temperatures are in the triple digits. So this is going to be ongoing through the weekend. Know that that will be very dry, very hot, and very uncomfortable with very little in the way of rain, unless you are lucky to be in that part of Arizona and Nevada and up into Colorado where the monsoon takes place. We also have a fire danger that's building, and this is building out in the west. This is building for parts of Oregon, over into parts of uh, Utah, also into Nevada. So we're going to keep an eye on that. We're getting those very dry conditions going. So how about those temperatures? Let's talk about your Saturday. Look at this. They're fairly comfortable compared to what we've seen. And unless you're in the Southern Plains, and that's where you're dealing with triple digits. But even out west, we're looking at lovely, comfortable temperatures that will be in the 70s. And if we go into your Sunday, again, other than the Plains, where it will be smoking hot, we are looking at comfortable temperatures coast to coast. So, glad you can get outside. You can barbecue. And if you're not in Florida, you really won't need that umbrella in the Northeast. All right. I'm looking forward to that, Tammy. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Meanwhile, let's go to Iceland. Check out the lava spewing out of this volcano for the sixth time since December. We're going to take a closer look. Coming up, you're streaming CBS News 24-7. Take a look at this. A volcano erupted again for the sixth time since December. It started last night, and it has continued into the morning. This is happening in Iceland. You can see this lava spewing. Officials there say some roads in the area are closed, but no one's in danger right now, if you can believe it. Uh, the nearby Blue Lagoon Spa, which is a well-known tourist attraction, which I've actually had the joy of visiting, well, that was evacuated last night because of this lava flow. Uh, we'll keep an eye out on the developments out there in Iceland, and if there's anything that, brings, uh, that warrants an update, we'll bring it to you live right here on CBS News 24-7. But for now, the good news, no one is hurt. All right, let's talk about Canada and how that government there is forcing a labor deal to meet rail worker, railroad worker demands. In the meantime, some railways are still chugging along after a strike temporarily halted some product shipments. Here's what the country's labor minister had to say about the long-term impacts. Workers, farmers, ranchers, commuters, small businesses, miners, chemists, scientists, the list goes on and the impacts cannot be understated and they extend to every corner of this country. All right, Global News reporter Heidi Petrarchik is live from Halifax, where trains are already moving this morning. Heidi, uh, what led to this, and how will we see uh, rail, rail traffic uh, moving again? Well, I'm here at the Canadian National Rail Yard in Halifax, where there has been some movement of trains this morning because unionized workers did go back on the job today after CN ended its lockout last night after the minister ordered binding arbitration with all parties involved. But there is another side to this equation, and that's Canadian Pacific Kansas City Rail 
and the unionized workers, which still appear to be at an impasse. That lockout continues, still affecting rail traffic, particularly commuter rail in Canada. The two sides meeting as we speak, actually, with the Canada Industrial Relations Board to try to hammer something out. One side, CPKC, saying that the union is looking at challenging the constitutionality of being ordered into binding arbitration, and the union saying that it's not convinced the Industrial Relations Board will order it back to work when it comes to Canadian Pacific. So there is still work to do today, and it's crucial to the Canadian economy. Uh, and Heidi, just remind our viewers here in the United States, what exactly are uh, the striking rail workers demanding? Wages are one thing that comes up a lot, especially in times of inflation like this and, and short staffing. But a lot of the concerns center around safety, around rest periods, around shift work. The union saying that the railways are trying to essentially squeeze more out of fewer workers and they're concerned that that could lead to uh, safety issues on the job. And also uh, relocation is an issue, particularly with CPKC. So that's been a real sticking point. All right, Heidi, thank you so much for reporting for us from Halifax, Canada. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, we've got much, much, much more news coming into the newsroom right now, including what's next on the campaign trail for Vice President Kamala Harris after her historic night at the DNC. Stick around. You're streaming CBS News 24-7. People of color have faced greater barriers when learning how to swim historically. Obstacles include racist interactions like being denied access to community pools and swim lessons for generations, which has led to significant racial disparities. Statistics show about 58 percent of young black children and 56 percent of Latino children do not know how to swim, and most adults of color have never taken a swim class. Elise Preston tells us how one man in Los Angeles is trying to change that narrative by offering lessons in his own backyard pool. This isn't your usual swim class. So take your time and back your steps and go slowly. And Conrad Cooper isn't your typical instructor. Why are you kicking so fast? Are you in a hurry? You have a date or something? For three decades, the 70 year old has been juggling tens of thousands of little ones, <laughs> teaching them to swim in this backyard saltwater pool. It was about getting kids who initially looked like me to get comfortable in the water. Diversity in aquatics is lacking. Cooper took note when his own nieces started swim lessons 30 years ago. So he dove into teaching. Do you think the fact that you are black, do you think that helps the children trust you a little bit more, that it helps the families trust you? Absolutely. Often they've been someplace else, they weren't treated quite the same way, in a different kind of environment, not like this. That reflection is desperately needed in a world where children of color face greater safety risks in water. When you look at the numbers, black children are seven times more likely to drown in a pool. Absolutely. That's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. And I'm helping to get them uh, out of that particular situation where they are now safe and comfortable in the water. A heartbreak Cooper's wife and business partner, Londa Parks, knows. Her own brother drowned when she was just a toddler. So he was just eight years old and he didn't know how to swim. Cooper's presence puts both four-year-old Bodie and his father at ease. You better stay there. <laughs> Him, I think he could view Conrad as like an uncle. It's a reflection of how I grew up and what, you know, and how I learned to swim. Davina Jackson's children inspired her to take the plunge at 37 years old. It was an amazing feeling. Like, I don't have to have the fear that something's going to happen. When you look at how many people of color around the country are not swimming, mm -hmm. what is your biggest hope? That they continue to find somewhere where they can have access to a pool and learn better swim lessons in communities that are underserved. While it took some coaxing at first, this group of kids ended the week with some smiles and a sense of achievement. Elise Preston, CBS News, Los Angeles. All right, we have some breaking news coming into the newsroom. We have just learned that the United States Secret Service has placed multiple agents on leave. This, of course, stems from that assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump in Butler, Pennsylvania. One of the agents placed on leave is the head of the agency's Pittsburgh field office. The Secret Service has said it is committed to investigating the decisions and the actions of personnel related 
to that rally and that assassination attempt in Butler, Pennsylvania. This is coming into the newsroom right now. Obviously, we're going to stay on top of the story. We'll bring you more developments uh, as warranted. But if you're just joining us now, the Secret Service has placed multiple agents on leave in the wake of that assassination attempt on former President Trump as they continue their investigation. An encore of CBS Mornings is coming up next. This is CBS News 24-7.